On October 27th, 2018, at 9.50 a.m., a man walked into Tree of Life Synagogue on the Squirrel Hill neighborhood of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Armed with a Colt AR-15 semi-automatic rifle and three Glock semi-automatic pistols, he opened fire on the worshipers. Shortly after, police received calls from people inside the synagogue. Police sources say that the shooter yelled, all Jews must die during the shooting. At around 10 a.m., um, police arrived and exchanged fire with the shooter. A SWAT team arrived shortly thereafter. At 11.08 a.m., an injured shooter surrendered. As he received medical care in police custody, he allegedly told a SWAT officer that he wanted all Jews to die and that Jews, were committing, that Jews were committing genocide against his people. In all, 11 people were killed, six were injured, including four police officers. Those killed were Joyce Feinberg, Richard Gottfried, Rose Malinger, Jerry Rabinowitz, Cecil Rosenthal, David Rosenthal, Bernice Simon, Sylvian Simon, Daniel Stein, Melvin Wax, and Irving Younger. The shooting is believed to be the deadliest single attack on the Jewish community in the history of, of the United States. Like most people, I was horrified and saddened by yet another mass shooting. As a sociologist who studies and teaches about race and religion, I was also perplexed. I knew that anti-Semitism exists in the US, of course. Uh, I knew that anti-Semitic hate crimes are still among the most common religious hate crimes in the US. But I also believed that anti-Semitism just isn't a major problem in the US. It sent me down a rabbit hole, reading everything I could get my hands on to understand anti-Semitism in the US today. That is the genesis of this talk. I do not at all mean to be, I do not, all, I do not at all mean for the title to be flippant or lighthearted. It's a genuine reaction that I had initially to the shooting in Pittsburgh. In 2021, how is this still a thing? It's an honor to be part of this year's, uh, this year's Holocaust, Awareness Week, Holocaust Awareness Week series. My talk tonight is a bit different than the other talks typically. Many of the events focus on historical events and genocides in far off places. As a sociologist, I'm especially interested in understanding what's happening here today and how it relates to things that have happened in the past. I hope that my talk is in the spirit of this week-long event and its exploration of how hate and violence can happen. On the one hand, Jewish Americans are by all accounts well-liked. Many American Jews are highly beloved entertainers, politicians, judges, and accomplished public figures. Surveys tell us a similar story. In a, in a 2014 survey, a national sample of adults were asked to rate religious groups on a feeling thermometer, ranging from zero, the coldest, to 100, the warmest. Jews were rated an average of 63, the highest of any religious group. And notably, Jews were the only group in the survey to receive an overall warm rating, and, or over an average of 50, from members of every other religious group in the survey. Recent surveys commissioned by the Anti-Defamation League find that strongly anti-Semitic beliefs are held by a relatively small percentage of people. Their 2016 survey found that only 14% of adults in the US have anti-Semitic propensities, meaning that they agreed with the majority of statements like Jews have too much power in the US today. Jews are more loyal to Israel than to America. Jews stick together more than other Americans and Jews are more willing than others to use shady practices to get what they want. And notably, this is down from about 30% of adults in the 1960s. Moreover, on the survey, a majority of people expressed concern about anti-Semitism and agreed that the government plays an important role in addressing it. So far, so good. But there are reasons for concerns as well. 
the Anti-Defamation League um, tabulated over 2,000 anti-Semitic incidents that occurred in 2019, including threats, physical assaults, vandalism, and attacks on Jewish institutions. That figure is the highest number on record since the organization began tracking incidents in 1979. FBI data tell a similar story. Hate crime incidents targeting Jews and Jewish in institutions in the US have, have in fact increased in recent years. For example, in 2019, uh, in April 2019, a woman was killed and three other people were injured when a gunman opened fire at the Shabbat of Poe Synagogue in Poe, California. The shooter had posted an anti-Semitic letter on 8chan, a website that I'll talk about a bit later. There's been an increase in anti-Semitic incidents in the New York City area, where of course there's a large Jewish population. In December 2018, for example, a man invaded the home of a rabbi in Monsey, New York and stabbed five people. It was the seventh night of the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah. The perpetrator had written about his anti-Semitic views at length in a set of journals found later by investigators. And more broadly, the Southern Poverty Law Center reported that in 2018, for the fourth straight year, the number of hate groups had grown. According to the SPLC, the vast majority of hate groups including neo-Nazis, the Ku Klux Klan, racist skinheads, neo-Confederates, and white nationalists adhere to some form of white supremacist ideology. Anti-Semitism is a key component of white supremacist ideology, as I'll discuss later. As the title of my talk suggests, my focus is on contemporary anti-Semitism, but understanding what's going on understanding what's going on today often requires looking at the past. Anti-Semitism has a long history in the U.S. The Jewish population in the U.S. grew dramatically from the 1880s to the early 1920s. Over, over two million Jews, mostly from Eastern Europe, uh, migrated to the U.S. during this time. In the 1930s, and particularly during the Great Depression, anti-Semitism was common. There were numerous anti-Semitic organizations at the time. Remarkably, a German-American organization called the Bund held a, a Nazi rally in Madison Square Garden in 1939. Over 20,000 supporters were, 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 were in attendance. Also public figures such as Henry Ford and the radio preacher Charles Coughlin had large platforms from which to disseminate anti-Semitism. And discrimination against Jews was fairly commonplace. Restrictive neighborhood covenants sometimes forbade Jews from buying homes in, in certain neighborhoods. Many universities had quotas that limited the number of Jews who could attend. Country clubs sometimes excluded Jews from being members or guests. Overt displays of anti-Semitism became less common after World War II but anti-Semitism has remained intact, thriving on the fringes of society and even making its way into the mainstream from time to time. Before I get any further, I'd, I'd like to mention a book that I'll draw on heavily tonight. Published in 2019, Anti-Semitism Here and Now was written by Deborah Lipstadt, a professor at Emory University and author of several books on Jewish history and Holocaust a denialism. So, what is anti-Semitism? The sociologist Helen Fine defines it as a persisting latent structure of hostile beliefs towards Jews as a collectivity manifested in individuals as attitudes and in culture as myth, ideology, folklore, and imagery, and in actions, social or legal discrimination, political mobilization against Jews, and collective state violence, which results in and or is designed to distance, displace, or destroy Jews as Jews. In her book, Lipstadt stresses in particular the word persisting. She writes, it doesn't go away. It's not a one-time event. Though its outer form may evolve over time, its essence remains the same. It's tempting to 
think of anti-Semitism as a form of racism, since we're so familiar with the latter. Racism, of course, emerged a few hundred years ago as an ideology which asserts that racial groupings exist and have distinct physical, cultural, or geographical, geographical differences that distinguish them from other racial groupings. Racism, as an ideology, holds that these groups are hierarchical and unequal in terms of meaningful qualities such as intelligence, attractiveness, work ethic, the capacity for citizenship, and so on. The content of such ideology changes over time, of course, and it conveniently serves to justify social domination and racial, and, um, racial oppression. Similar to Helen Fine's definition of anti-Semitism, we think of racism both as an individual psychological phenomenon, as well as rooted in culture and in societal institutions. Yet, anti-Semitism is different in some regards. As Deborah Lipstadt puts it, racists punch up. Sorry. As Deborah Lipstadt puts it, racists punch down, anti-Semites punch up. That is to say, racists believe that inferior groups are just that, inferior and incapable. They need to be separated, controlled, or oppressed, both for their own good as well as for the good of society. But anti-Semites punch up, as Lipstadt says. Jews are thought to be capable of cunning, control, and domination. She describes it as ugly as a herpes virus because it comes out when there's moments of tension. Anti-Semitism has been rightfully called the longest or oldest hatred, and it often comes out in moments of tension, economic dislocation, or political dislocation. It's useful to think of anti-Semitism as essentially a conspiracy theory. It goes something like this. Jews are not loyal to the countries in which they live, Rather, they seek to gain power, money, and control on a global scale and to undermine the countries in which they live. As a conspiracy theory, anti-Semitism is flexible and adaptable as social conditions and concerns change. Jews have historically been a scapegoat, which has been common in Europe, and all too tragically during the Holocaust. In the early 1900s, anti-Semitism centered on Jews as ruthless, cunning capitalists seeking control over American institutions. Or on the right, views were Jew Jews were viewed as supporting anti-American efforts to introduce socialism and communism. As with other forms of prejudice, anti-Semitism occurs in varying degrees and types. Lipstadt, in her book, offers a taxonomy of the anti-Semite that I found to be useful. The first type she, she refers to as the extremist. In, in the US, this is best exemplified in the far right, white supremacist or white power movement. The so-called Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia in August 2017 brought many of its supporters together. Their demonstration was prompted by the debate at the time over the removal of Confederate statues. Organizers also saw the event as an opportunity to unify the myriad of groups and organizations that make up the white supremacist movement. Klansmen were in attendance, as were neo-Nazi groups, neo-Confederates, members of the so-called alt-right, and prominent leaders in the white power movement and in the far-right media landscape. Anti-Semitism was on full display at the event. At one point, of course, notoriously, marchers chanted, you will not replace us, and Jews will not replace us. M Media outlets reported that marchers repeatedly used anti-Semitic slurs and yelled anti-Semitic chants. For those familiar with the outcome, of course, we know that it turned violent on both days, and one woman died when a white supremacist drove a car into a crowd of counter-protesters. White supremacists subscribe to a white genocide conspiracy theory, which asserts that people of color, immigration, multiculturalism, Islam, and other forces will undermine and eventually eliminate white culture and people. For white supremacists, Jews are at the helm of this effort. 
This apparently motivated the shooter in Pittsburgh in 2018. He was active on websites and social media platforms used by white supremacists and frequently posted anti-Semitic content. He'd grown increasingly upset about a group of Central American migrants making its way through Mexico toward the US at the time. A far, a far right conspiracy theory posited that Jews were funding and aiding the migrant caravan. The shooter narrowed in on the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society or HIAS, a Jewish nonprofit organization that provides, refu that, that provides aid to refugees. Shortly before the attack, he posted the following on Gab, a social media platform used by many white supremacists. Hyas likes to bring invaders in that kill our people. I can't sit by and watch my people get slaughtered. Screw your optics, I'm going in. According to the Southern Poverty Law Center, the mention of optics references a disagreement that has raged within the white nationalist movement since, since the Unite the Right rally in 2017 about how best to get their message across to the general public. I also want to give credit to and recommend another book that helped me understand these groups, American Swastika uh, by Pete Simi and Robert Fertrell based in part on unprecedented access that these researchers had to white supremacist groups and their private spaces. This book is an essential read if you want to understand this movement. This last example of Gab and the shooter in Pittsburgh highlights the role of the internet and social media in perpetuating anti-Semitism and white supremacist ideology. Experts, social scientists, and journalists who track on anti-Semitism, the alt-right and white supremacists, consistently argue that the internet and social media play a critical role. Exposure to these ideologies and groups used, used to require attending a meeting, getting materials in the mail, or other means. Today, they're just a click away. White power groups were quick to take advantage of the internet and online forums. Launched in 1996, Stormfront is one of the oldest white supremacists and neo-Nazi websites, but it's still quite active. If you visit today, you'll see that it remains an active hub for sharing ideas, announcing events, and building community. When I visited, the counter indicated that the site had had over 20,000 unique visitors in the previous 24 hours. Given that their beliefs and their subculture are marginalized today, Aryans and white supremacists seek out and create spaces where they build community, offer mutual aid to each other, and bond. Newer white supremacist websites and podcasts such as The Right Stuff, The Daily Stormer, and others feature anti-Semitism and racism frequently. Social media platforms and online forums where basically anything goes, such as 4chan, 8chan, Gab, and Discord, allow anti-Semites and extreme racists to share ideas, bond, plan, and build community. The internet allows those with beliefs and ideas on the margins of society to easily find each other. Experts also point to YouTube playing an important role as well. It's algorithm designed to, 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 to suggest and then play ever more provocative and hard to turn away from videos tend to lead viewers to darker and stronger racist and often anti-Semitic content. The internet's also a means of anti-Semitic action and organizing. In recent years, Jewish journalists, or journalists perceived to be supportive of Jews, uh, have been increasingly targeted by anti-Semites uh, and white supremacists on Twitter and elsewhere. One common but chilling method of anti-Semitic anti targeting and harassment is the use of triple parentheses around the names of Jewish journalists or organizations Uh, thought to be controlled by Jews. The practice, also known as an echo, originated with the alt-right blog, The Right Stuff. In preparing for this lecture, I spent some time myself on 8chan, a website known for having and facilitating anti-Semitic and racist content. Like 4chan, 8chan is an, 8chan is an image board 
or website with forums, which operates mostly via posting images. This makes 4chan and 8chan popular sites for the creation and sharing of memes, for example. I discovered a lot of anti-Semitic, of anti-Semitism in the form of ethnic slurs, neo-Nazi content, and conspiracy theorizing. As I had read elsewhere, extreme online content makes frequent reference to ZOG, which stands for Zionist Occupied Government. Anti-Semites online make, make frequent reference to organizations, institutions, and governments that they believe to be controlled by Jews. I also found debates about whether or not posting and sharing content is enough, or whether violence is necessary. Some posters valorized and praised individuals who have engaged in recent violent hate crimes, such as Dylan Roof, Robert Bowers, or, or Brenton Tarrant, the shooter in the recent massacres, sorry, the recent massacre in New Zealand. Others engaged in conspiracy theorizing about how Jews must be behind those incidents in an effort to advance nefarious goals. The use of triple parentheses was common in referring to people or organizations thought to be controlled by Jews. The alt-right is worth a brief mention, as it's an important development. It's short for alternative right, a term coined by noted white supremacist Richard Spencer. A loosely organized and diverse movement, it sees itself as an alternative to the mainstream right or conservative movement, which it views as too weak and impotent on issues of race and immigration. The alt-right skews a bit younger, better educated, and has a heavy online presence. Not all who identify with the alt-right are white supremacists or anti-Semites, but many are. Adherents of the alt-right believe that whites should be able to preserve their heritage and culture and that multiculturalism is a major threat. They avoid imagery and slogans typically associated with, with traditional white power organizations and movements. The more I learn about the white power movement, the more I realize that anti-Semitism is a common thread that runs through each of them and their ideologies, and that this anti-Semitism is inseparably linked to other forms of hate and extreme prejudice. This links acts of violence to each other in a way that observers and journalists often don't. The targeting of a black church in Charleston, South Carolina in 2015, uh, the mass shooting at Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh in 2018, and the violent act at two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand in 2019. News media often talk about the shooters as lone wolves who engage in senseless acts that will, never un that, that will never understand. In reality, they were all deeply involved in the white power movement, motivated by extreme racist ideology that demonizes Jews, Muslims, immigrants, and others. Most recently, we witnessed that anti-Semitism was on display in the storming of the US Capitol building in January. Anti-Semitic imagery and language were visible, including a man wearing this t-shirt, as well as white supremacist symbolism, including the swastika. Experts on anti-Semitism have also found, have found strong echoes of it in the QAnon conspiracy theory that motivated many of those who participated in the riot, as well as among the Proud Boys who played an important role in organizing and in attending the event. As one expert, an activist who observed all this put it, Jews function for today's white nationalists as they often have for anti-Semites through the centuries, as the demons stirring an otherwise changing and heterogeneous pot of lesser evils. Anti-Semitism, of course, exists in many forms and to differing degrees. In her taxonomy of anti-Semites, Deborah Lipstadt devotes much of her book to what she calls anti-Semitic anti enablers, a characterization that's perhaps more controversial than labeling extremists. 
to Lipstadt, anti-Semitic enablers are those who may or may not personally be anti-Semitic, but facilitate the spread of anti-Semitism as they act out of their own political or ideological motives. She uses President Donald Trump as an example. In some speeches and tweets, he would sometimes veer, albeit subtly, into anti-Semitic tropes and stereotypes and sentiments. He has at time retweeted images and videos with anti-Semitic undertones as well. Perhaps most controversially, controversially, of course, he was reluctant to distance himself from anti-Semitism or condemn it. Shortly after the violence in 2017 at, at the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, Trump infamously condemned the egregious display of hatred, bigotry, and violence on many sides. The next day, he said that there were, quote, very fine people who were marching among the white supremacists. Deborah Lipstadt also uses Jeremy Corbyn as an example of a possible anti-Semitic enabler. Corbyn is an important figure in the British Parliament as the former leftist leader of the Labour Party. The Member of Parliament has a history of defending and associating with controversial figures with anti-Semitic views. The idea of anti-Semitism on the left was, I will admit, initially perplexing for me, as it might be for many. In her book, Lipstadt argues that anti-Semitism can find a place on the left because of the left's deep concern with the concentration of power and money, imperialist foreign policy, and the strong inclination to identify with oppressed groups and people of color. This sometimes manifests itself in debates over Israel, Zionism, and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The issues recently gained some attention in the U.S. because of comments made by Representative Omar Ilhan, a Somali-American congresswoman from Minnesota. In, in, in 2012, she tweeted, Israel has hypnotized the world. May Allah waken the people and help them to see the evil doings of Israel. In February of 2019, in an exchange with journalist Glenn Greenwald, uh, she tweeted, it's all about the Benjamins, baby, in reference to American politicians' support for Israel, uh, and in reference to the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, or, or APAC, a lobbying group, uh, that advocates for pro-Israel policies to the U.S. government. At a bookstore event later that month, she said, I want to talk about the political influence in this country that says that it's okay for people to push for allegiance to a foreign country. Critics say that she crossed a line in anti-Semitism by drawing on old tropes and stereotypes about money, control, and foreign loyalties. But she's been defended by other progressive politicians in the US, like Bernie Sanders, and who worry that efforts to condemn her are merely political, and that, and that they reflect a desire to shut down a legitimate and important discussion about US foreign policy toward Israel. Others on the left argue that allegations of anti-Semitism are unfounded, and that Judaism on the one hand and Zionism and the state of Israel on the other should not be conflated. Zionism is a term that, of course, refers to the Jewish nation nationalist movement, supporting the establishment and protection of a Jewish state, Israel. Peter Beinart, uh, a CUNY professor and contributor, to, and contributor to the Atlantic, and I think notably an observant Jew, has argued along with others that anti-Zionism is not synonymous with anti-Semitism. For one, he argues, many ethnic groups don't have their own nations, and many countries have built nations around civic nationalism rather than ethnic or religious nationalism. He argues that Israel's current model of ethnic and religious nationalism excludes Palestinians from full participation and, and, and recognition, both Palestinian citizens of Israel as well as those in occupied territories. He writes, to seek to replace Israel's ethnic nationalism with civic nationalism, however, is not inherently bigoted, noting that a few years ago, three Palestinian members of the Knesset, the, uh, the parliament, the, the, uh, the legislature in Israel, uh, had introduced a bill to turn Israel from a Jewish state into a state for all its citizens. 
As one of those Knesset members, Jamal Zahalka explained, we do, not de- we do not deny Israel or its right to exist as a home for Jews. We are simply saying that we want to base the existence of the state not on the preference of Jews, but on the basics of equality. The state should exist in the framework of equality and not in the framework of preference and superiority. Finally, Beinart notes that Zionism can exist alongside anti-Semitism, and anti-Zionism can exist in the absence of anti-Semitism. Historically, many European leaders and American conservatives have supported Zionism while holding anti-Semitic beliefs, perhaps in part because they hold the anti-Semitic beliefs. Some Christian conservative leaders have, have fallen into this category, like Pat Robertson, Alt-right leader Richard Spencer has expressed support for Israel as a, as a model of an ethnic state. Meanwhile, some Hasidic Jews and progressive Jews oppose Zionism, and it would be hard to call them anti, anti-Semitic. In her book and in interviews I've read, Deborah Lipstadt expresses concern that progressives' efforts to criticize Israel and U.S. policy toward Israel can amount to efforts at in her words, the toxification of Israel and single out Israel unfairly while letting many other nations off the hook for abuses and questionable policies. She expresses concern that supporters of the BDS movement, that stands for Boycott, Divest, and Sanction Israel, view the Israeli state as illegitimate, which denies Jews their own country, which is inherently anti-Semitic in her view. She does, however, acknowledge that overly loose accusations of anti-Semitism can be counterproductive. It's likely that these debates will continue in the U.S., particularly as the Democratic coalition becomes more diverse. Representative Omar Ilhan is a really good example. And as Democratic politicians feel more open to critiquing Israeli policies and the pro-Israel lobby, I, for one, remain somewhat baffled and humbled as I try to make sense of where valid criticism of Israel and Zionism ends and where anti-Semitism begins. For what it's worth, I've read several defenses of AIPAC from American Jews who say that its influence is often overstated and that progressives do a disservice by refusing to engage with it or to attend its conference as those in attendance represent a wide spectrum politically and in their views of Israeli policies. So, how do you end a lecture on anti-Semitism? I'm not really sure. Ending is always difficult. First, I want to say thanks for letting me talk about my research into this complex, fascinating, very divisive and vexing issue. And I hope that you got something out of it. Deborah Lipstadt wrote a piece for Time magazine shortly after the shooting at at Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh in in 2019. Here's a photo of an interfaith vigil held in Pittsburgh shortly after the shooting. I'll close with the lessons that she thinks we can all learn in these troubled times of, it seems, growing anti-Semitism. She says, do not look for haters only on the other side of the political transom. Those on the political left who only see anti-Semitism on the right have blinded themselves to what's happening in their own midst. Those on the political right who are only concerned about the lefties on campus and beyond are blind to what's happening next to them. Second, we may never change the minds of people who send pipe bombs or enter a sanctuary with guns blazing, but we can stop them from influencing others. This year at Thanksgiving dinner, when your curmudgeon uncle or successful cousin, not all haters are old and ornery, begins to rant about Jews, blacks, Muslims, and LGBTQs who are ruining this country, do not sit idly by. Challenge them. Do so not to change their minds, but to teach, but to reach others, especially young people who are listening and watching and learning. Silence is an imprimatur for hate and prejudice. Third, do not think that this attack is only about Jews. 
It may start with the Jews, but it never ends there. And conversely, it may start with others, Muslims, African Americans, LGBT, LGBTQ identifying folks, but it will ultimately reach Jews. In Jewish tradition, upon mourning the dead, we say, may their memory be for a blessing. Today, we should say the memory of all those killed and the suffering of those who have been wounded be for a blessing and for a lesson, a lesson we ignore at our personal, national, and moral risk. Thank you.